weeks to get introductions, you always wonder if you're ever gonna be able to live up to any of those. A uh, guy, one of my partners, who's a creative director at our agency, told me, uh, you know, I, I grew a beard about a year, I guess it's been about two years ago, during Christmas break. And he said, you gotta keep that. And I said, really, you think this looks okay? And he said, no, not really. But he said, facial hair lowers expectations. And that's a big deal. So for me, I've constantly looked for ways to lower expectations because it appears to be the only way I'll succeed. Um, so hopefully, your expectations today, um, you know, it, it's, it's funny because in my business, um, the most important thing I can do uh, is to help people, um, as Pat said, tell their story. And so I'm not going to tell my story so much today. Um, what I want to do is help tell your story and what your story might look like. Because you're all in a really interesting place in a super interesting time in the, in the world as it relates to business. And, um, and I wanna walk you through maybe what's happened to me, because I, I feel like, uh, well, do you guys, have, have any of you ever seen this? Uh, do you know that guy? Who knows this guy? Baymax. Baymax. Who is Baymax? Baymax. Yeah, very good. He's like some giant marshmallow guy from Big Hero 6, this movie. And I love uh, companies like Pixar because they, I have, I have kids and, you know, when you go to kids' movies, when you have smart kids' movies, they're even more fun. And this one is, it certainly sits in that. And um, this guy is a very gentle, kind, helpful guy who is not without flaws himself. Um, he, he says, my, one of my kids' favorite parts of this movie is when they ask him as they're trying to escape and he just kind of waddles along like you would think a marshmallow guy like that looking guy would waddle. And you know, the guy said, hey, what, what are you doing? And Baymax really honestly just said, I am not fast. <laughs> well, as it relates to you today, I have a little bit of a different thing on this thing. Um, I, I'm not young anymore. Right? You are. And so the question is, how do I bridge some experiences that I've had into a way that makes sense for you today? And, and that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, and, and because I'm not exactly the same age as you today, I've been, I, I came out of school in, and had my first professional job full time in 1988, April 1988. So that gives you an idea. If that's the proof point to this line, right? Um, but I, I think it's been a really interesting time because I think some things have happened in that, in that period of time that kind of almost blow your mind, if you really think about it. And I want to walk you through this a little bit because I think it'll help set up, hopefully, why some of the things I'll say a little bit later can help with your story. So the first thing, I want to start here from the beginning for me. It's not the beginning of time, even though some of you, when you look at this, say, Does that, like, is that a typewriter? Uh, I was the last class at the University of Utah to take advanced journalism where we had to come in every day and write our stories on that, okay? Very last class, the next year they brought computers in. Um, so that gives you an idea of where I started with this. And in that class, I had a professor who said, after class one day, why don't you come up here, Todd? And, and he said, do uh, you have a job? And I said, well, I have one. He said, you want another one? And I, I'd known this guy had placed a lot of people in marketing in, in the Salt Lake area. So I said, you tell me what I need to do, Professor Sorensen, and I'll go wherever you want me to go. So he hands me this little piece of paper that said 139 East West Temp or, uh, South Temple, ask for Bob Fotheringham. So I drove right down, right after class. Now this was before cell phones, internet, anything. So I had no idea when I'm sitting in the lobby of this place what they even did. He said, I'm here to see Bob Fotheringham. Great, he'll be with you in a second. So as I was looking around, I'm like, what do they do here? And I went to the receptionist and I said, hey, what do you do here? And she said, well, we're an advertising agency. And I thought, oh, great. Professor Sorensen doesn't think I can write, because why would he send me to an ad agency if he thought I could write, which is what I really wanted to do. Um, ended up meeting this guy, uh, went to work at this agency. Super, super interesting starting point for me, because uh, I saw a bunch of different businesses really young and really early. Um, I also experienced something that was, that was really important then. Um, anybody have any idea what these things are? Yeah, fax machines. When I worked at Fotheringham, we were on the fourth floor. On the seventh floor of this building, there were these things. Not these exact things, but they looked a lot like this. Although these are a bit more advanced because, well, the one on the right, you can see the paper starting to curl. Pat, do you remember when you got faxes and they were all curled up and you had to like straighten them out and put stuff on them to, to read them? Well, if we had something... 
Uh, right, okay. We, we, had, we had, if something was really important at, at my agency and it had to be delivered to a client, um, but it better be really important. He went up to the seventh floor and he sent a fax. And the reason it better be important is because it costs like seven or eight bucks to send them, right? But hey, if it was critical, this is where it happened. Um, and that was, that was how we kind of talked then. Um, about the same time, this got red hot. Uh, I had a chance to work for the guy that was one of the, found, uh, one of the founders of this company. And um, it was interesting because the company was actually founded as, as a dorm room project, an MBA project by Fred Smith at, when he was at Yale, thinking this, if I could put logistics together to make this work, wouldn't this be amazing? Because essentially, it helped you do the, a little bit longer version of what that fax did, except for I could send real physical things that way. I could send a presentation, I could do all this. But again, if you were gonna do this when I started, it better be important. It had better be important, okay? So that's the world that I started in. And I was working on all kinds of clients, mostly clients who um, didn't pay us, or clients that nobody thought would succeed. Because when you're, you know, in your senior year of, of college and you get hired to write copy, those are the clients I got. So I worked on a lot of stuff that nobody thought would ever win, or people who didn't pay us, um, because they figured that I couldn't screw that up at that point. And one of the clients that I worked on was this company that um, I thought had zero chance at all of succeeding long term because they were losing more customers than they were than they were keeping, and I just couldn't see why. But the people were so interesting; they were smart, they were aggressive, they were creative, they were all the things I wanted to be, and they offered me a job, and I went to work for this company. Um, this is not a picture of me, but it's close to about what it would have been like then. The company was called McCoss Cellular, um, and they uh, they were just starting to gather cellular licenses from all over the United States and try to put together what they thought would be this really interesting thing, because if you could talk to people and not places, that could change everything. And I ended up working in Salt Lake for about five years, and then I went to Seattle and worked 10 years with a guy by the name of Craig McCaw, who is widely viewed as the person who is the founder of wireless technology. Didn't invent the technology, but got it going to where it became the fastest consumer electronics uh, product in history. Um, now, I wish I could tell you I thought that was going to work. I already told you I didn't. Um, the thing I thought was, hey, I just graduated. I've got a brand new white Jetta. If I've got one of these phones and that kind of business mullet haircut and the Ray-Bans, I may be able to get dates. So that's what I did. And it actually kind of worked to some degree, right? So that was my introduction into cellular. It was my introduction into you know things of saying, hey, how do you bet on things that are really going to happen, and will they happen? I kind of continued this, uh, this thing of being a, a real visionary genius when I got my first, I was one of the few people in my office that got a computer. Most people didn't have them. I got them because I was writing a lot of ad copy, I was writing a lot of uh, press stuff, and uh, so piece by piece people started to accumulate computers in this office. And one day some guy showed up from Seattle, not from my office, he came from Seattle, and he said, I'm going to take your computer for about four days. And I said, no, you're not. And he said, yeah, I am. It's really critical. And I said, why? And he said, I'm going to put a hard drive in this computer. And I said, what is a hard drive? You can store all kinds of stuff. And I said, I got those. I don't need your hard drive to store anything. And he said, you're not going to believe this. This hard drive holds 40 megabytes of data. I need to take it. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of floppy disks. So four days later, my computer showed up and I had my first 40 meg hard drive, okay? Again, I didn't let him take it because I actually thought I'd ever need it. I just thought it'd be, it was pretty impressive. That was a big number then. So as I continued to be a long searching, uh, somebody who had a lot of vision for down the road, I had the same guy from Seattle show up about a year later and say, uh, we need to have a class for you guys. And I said, what's the class about? And he said, well, we're going to teach you how to use electronic mail. So think, think about that. We like, took the company together and had a half-day training on how to use email. I raised my hand really quickly because I'm somebody who asks a lot of questions and, and somebody uh, who's not afraid to express an opinion. I said, hey, why are we doing this? And he said, what do you mean why are we doing this? It's email. And I said, OK, but who will ever send a message when you can just call someone? I was clearly ahead of this trend, and, uh, and 
despite my long-term vision, email turned out to be something that happened. They even made corny, you know, romantic comedy movies about it. So keeping that path, you know, going further along, when I, when I ended up going to Seattle, um, anybody know what this is? Pager. I hated these things when I first went out because every time a reporter called me about a pager, it was because they had some kid that was doing drugs off of the pager. And that's how they communicated, right? So I hated this technology, but we happened to own paging licenses all over the United States. Well, my boss said, you know, this is gonna change. And I said, how? And he said, we're, gonna, we're not gonna call it paging anymore. We're gonna call it messaging. <laughs> and I said, ooh, yeah, that's certainly appealing. That'll cause people to come in droves. And he said, no, when you make it two-way, this is gonna really take off. And what do you think I said? Who would ever sit and do this to send messages, right? Well, most of you today, if I asked you to raise your hand, would probably say, if I asked you to raise your hand and say, how many of you even have a voicemail on your cell phone? Most of you don't. If I said, what's your ratio of text to calls? It, it could probably be 100 to 1, right? This happened. And then a couple other things like clicked in along the way. Like uh, one day, I, and, and I'm, I really feel like I'm now becoming a dinosaur now. I'm telling you all this stuff, but uh, it'll help set up the second half of my thing. I had a guy come in and say, hey, we need to uh, get some budget because we need to secure the URL for macawcellular.com. And I said, what is a URL? And they said, and this is, I'm not joking, this is what he said. He said, it's the thing that helps people find you on the World Wide Web. He said those words. I'm like, whoa, that sounds like that might be a thing. And so we started buying these URLs out on this thing. And, you know, and it turns out, um, you know, we, I, I, the guy that was at FedEx that came to work at Macaw uh, then left and became the CEO of Netscape, uh, which if you go back and look and dust off your, your uh, internet history books, became really the window for how you see into the web. Um, but that didn't exist when I started, nor, by the way, did this. When all of a sudden, news didn't happen in an overnight deal, news happened by the minute. And then this happened. And news didn't happen by the minute by reporters, news happened by the second by all of us, right? So all of these things, and the reason I walk you through this is to let you know that I think my 25 years from when I was sitting in an audience like this, I would have never believed this could have all happened, not even remotely. What I am here to tell you right now is your 25 years going out, the speed will pick up even faster. And that's gonna require you to be really different than the people who were 25 years ahead of you and the people who were 25 years ahead of them. And it's, it changes kind of the way you have to look at things. If I were sitting in your chair right now, I'd think, oh wow, that's, that's Scary, and it is, but it's also the most exciting time you will ever run into to be walking into business right now. Um, I want to talk you through a couple of things as we go through this. I, I ended up, you know, after I spent uh, 10 years in Seattle and then three in, in, on the East Coast, um, I, the speed is crazy, and it kind of wears you out over time. And our company became a hostile takeover uh, uh, target for Carl Icahn. I don't know if any of you have heard of Carl Icahn. He's... Um, the, the uh, Barbarians at the Gate, an incredible book if you ever want to read one. Um, the movie Wall Street, the character, the Michael Douglas character was based on Carl Icahn. Very tough guy. Uh, so spent a year in a takeover battle with that as a member of the senior management team there. And, you know, I, I was ready to be kind of done with speed for a minute. And um, we had a, our uh, second daughter got sick and had to go through chemotherapy. And so we thought we need to be home. So we, we took a year, we thought came back to Utah and thought, okay, we'll slow down for a minute, we'll get Carly through her treatment, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of move forward from there. And about this time, this agency that I had done work with as a client, um, we started talking to I, 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 the, one of the, my partner now I'd stayed in touch with, and over time I just you know, kept saying, hey, what do you think about this, what do you think about this, and then I said, this is pretty interesting to me. And so I ended up buying into this company, and that's been 13 years ago. And the company is called the Summit Group. Um, the sign is, is in front of our building if you ever go by on 4th South and, um, and just off of West Temple. But I started into this world uh, where speed all collided again, and I got going. And the interesting thing about this world is most of the people I work with in this world are people like you. 
okay? Um, two thirds of our force, like in any consulting, uh, in any kind of consultancy are in their first or second jobs. About a third are people with 15 plus years of experience. Um, if you go to a law firm, it's the same way. If you go to an accounting firm, it's the same way. Same thing here. And so I ended up finding lots of people who look like you in this. And that's interesting, but remember when I said about this? Um, I'm not young. And so it looked and felt different to me at times. And kind of the pinnacle of when it felt most different to me, uh, a young woman, super bright, uh, professional, was fantastic um, in what she did for us. She'd been working with us about a year, and she came into my office, and I was uh, very close to her, came into my office and said, hey, Todd, I'm, I'm actually going to move on. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Tell me what's going on. Why? And she said something that just like completely baffled me. She said, I kind of feel like I've mastered this. And I thought, man, I must be really, really slow. I'm not fast like Baymax again because I've been doing this for 25 years and I don't feel like I've mastered it. And you've mastered this. And the more I thought about it, the more frustrated I got. And I started feeling like this. And I thought, ugh. You know, and you guys have probably heard this pointed at you to the point of you're like, oh my gosh, don't tell me about millennials, right? Um, these millennials, but I was saying these millennials, and I was literally these millennials, and my partner, who's actually even slightly older than I am, said to me, hey, we were in a conference room, he said, look, you cannot be the middle-aged white guy pounding his fist on a conference table about this workforce. And I was like, what? And I was literally pounding my fist, right? And he said, that's not, going to be, that's not going to be good for our business. And I went home and I thought about that a lot. And I thought, he's right. He is completely right about this. I have to look at this differently. And so what I, I started doing is saying two things. What could I learn and how could I help? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Let me tell you three things I completely admire about your generation. Now, that's an over generalization by putting you in a generation, right? But a couple things that I've learned from, from, from uh, some of the folks that have come through our office. The first thing is, I really love the, the overwhelming sense of optimism I get. And I don't know if that's because you're younger, I might be, um, but I love that because I run into people all the time who are, we, we can do this, we can do this, you know? And that's a good thing to have, to not ever lose that, super good. Second thing I love is your willingness to share an opinion. I love that. So many times when I was young, I sat and was nervous about, well, what if I said something? I have people right now early in their jobs who are absolutely willing to walk right into, our, into my office and say, I think this is what's right and this is what isn't about what we're doing. I love that. That is a huge plus about your group. And then the third thing that I really have a lot of admiration for that was different than from when Pat and I were starting is, you guys are so much more interested in experiences than you are in things right now. And that is a gigantic, that, that is an improvement that I'm trying to get much more close to in my life. Um, you know, that term when you saw that, that guy that I was showing you with the cell phone and the, that, you know, that guy would have been called a yuppie. And what yuppies were most interested in is, was acquiring things. That's not what you are by and large interested in unless those things are experiences. And I think that's really cool. So there are things that I'm learning every day. There are things I'd like to share. And when I first started thinking about this, I do what I, whenever I get like something going hard in my head, my, it, it, the best way for it to come out is, when I, is writing for me. And so I started writing this stuff down. And, and, um, and this is actually, it's actually turned into a little mini book, right? And, uh, and we started, you know, I was telling one of our art directors about this, and, he, and he, so he designed a book jacket for me, and, and you know, I called it Selfie Help in Business. Because I thought, what could I teach, what could I share that might be useful for somebody in your shoes from stuff I've learned from having gone through all these transitions that I just spoke to you about? So what I want to do today is to take you through a couple of these things. And a couple of them are ideas, a couple of them are things that I think if I were sitting in your shoes, I would want to incorporate in myself. And a couple of them are just tools that I think could be helpful for you. Does that seem like an okay way to spend the next 30 minutes of this-ish? Okay, good. That's what we're going to do. It's a good thing I got some head nods, yes, because if not, I would have had to like, let you all go right now. So that's why I asked the question before I like, told you what the vote meant, right? Because then you'd have all just left. 
Um, I'm going to start out with the one thing that initially you might view as unpopular, but I think it's a, a, it's a good setup for what I want to say. And it's this thing. Selfieism, in my view, in the long run, is not going to be attractive. Um, now, that doesn't mean I don't take selfies. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy when I see or get selfies. It means that the concept of being selfie is not going to play out great for people in the long run. That's just Todd's take, okay? And I just throw this back out to you on the most sort of like most extreme version of this. Your great grandparents, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather served in World War II, so a lot of your great grandparents probably did as well. I think about the mantle that sat in my grandpa's house. There was not one picture of him in that. It was all pictures of other people. He had pictures, all of other people. If you would have said to my grandfather, hey, grandpa, will you take a selfie for me? He would have been so uncomfortable doing it. I'm not sure he could have. I, I wonder how many, I mean, just play this out in your head. How many selfies do you take in a week? You know? Well, there's a couple of zeros. That's interesting. And by the way, if you take a million, it's all, you'll do just fine. Okay? I just want to throw this out, that this idea, there's something in between my grandfather who couldn't talk about himself and the most extreme version of what I would put as the selfieism thing of being completely enthralled with talking about yourself. There's something in between that. And that's the spot I think that from a business side in particular, you got to get to. Okay? So let's start with three ideas. Idea number one for you that I want you to just chew on um, is this one. This is a huge thing for you coming out right now. Curiosity. Uh, now, I'm in a business that's a creative business, and so this, it's, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, I get that that's why that works for you. But I am telling you, if, if one guy who sold a cable company, and if he would have decided to retire, instead of saying, you know what, people do not want to call places. I'm not interested in calling your home. I'm interested in reaching you. If he wouldn't have thought that, which, by the way, at the time was an incredibly creative idea, we wouldn't be having selfies right now because we wouldn't have a camera in our hand, right? Curiosity is king. It is in everything you do, and it's especially the case in business. And a couple things that I try to do to stay curious all the time, first off, we have a DNA in our company. We hire and fire for five things. The very first thing is curiosity. So I'll always ask people one question when I interview them. I'll say, what are you reading? What are you reading right now? Reading is one way to help you stay curious, and I'll get more to that, a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, right now, there are a million ways that you can learn. You know, the fact you're coming here on your lunch hour tells me that that's a sign of curiosity, first off. Um, you know, TED Talks. I do two TED Talks a week on wide ranges of things. It helps me stay curious. Another thing I would tell you from a curiosity side, I call them one-steppers. One-steppers are people who are one step ahead of me in anything I'm doing. Raising kids. Boy, I'll tell you what, I went to people and said, uh, how do you raise teenagers? I went to people who had done it before. You know, When you're in your spot in your career, find somebody who's one step ahead of you and talk to them. Talk to them, because it will help you. So find one-steppers. That'll help you stay curious. Our experience in our consultancy is it's not about answers as much as it is finding the right question. That's a big deal when it comes to this. So idea number one for you as you're thinking about how your, your career the next 25 years is going to shape out, item number one is find ways to stay curious. Item number two, um, this one is as, as true as it gets. Every single person has a customer. All of you do today. And the reason I bring this up this way is because a lot of times you think unless you're dealing with the direct customer of the business, you don't have a customer. And that is just not true. Being intentional about knowing you have a customer is everything. I'll give you two examples. We have an account coordinator who moved up like that in our agency. When I asked her, who's your customer? You know what she said? These account managers. Every day I wake up thinking, how do I make their lives easier? Guess who advocated for her to be promoted? The account managers, right? They got, she got who her customer was. I went, uh, we were in New York a couple weeks ago, we walked into a, a store, um, a fashion store, Ted Baker, and you know, as I walked in, 
um, I started talking to this kid, and, and he was just lit up, you know, about trying to help me. And I said, man, you really, you know, you're really good at this. And he said, he, he asked me if I'd walk over with him, and there was a change in a tile on the floor to hardwood. The hardwood was his department. He said, when somebody steps foot on that hardwood, they become my customer. And he said, they're going to get treated really well. And I thought, that's really interesting. He was so intentional about that. And so I ask you to think right now, who's your customer? Who's your customer right now? Okay? Because that, that'll be an idea that'll play out well for you as you re reach through in business. And then this last idea I want you to think about, and if there's anything I'd want you to take away from today, this is, I think, the most important thing I would leave you with, and it's this idea. Um, I think it's hard when you're just getting started because you want stuff to start paying off right now. Pay, you know, I got to have something to show for this, right? And I, would, I, I can't even tell you how strongly I would, I would counsel you to think investment, not harvest. And that's going to be tough. My story of investment professionally versus harvest was this. When I got over to this company that was a dynamite company that I loved, what I wanted to do was really be involved in the marketing of the company. The challenge was, at the time, I was not getting paid. I was getting paid $22,000 a year to be a marketer. I'd, I'd, recruited two of my friends to come in to sell these cell phones, right? Now keep in mind, they were, had to sell eight of them a month. We have wireless clients today where you can't even keep track of how many people are selling a month. But you know, they were, that, that little brick phone I was showing you, $3,000, 70 cents a minute to use. These were not easy things to sell at the time. So when you sold them, you made a lot of money. And these guys that I had brought in were making within the first year four times what I was making. And I said to my boss, wait, um, this seems crazy, you know? And he said to me, look, here's the deal. If you want to sell, I think you could do this, and I think you'd be pretty good at it, and you'll get paid that, probably more. But he said, do you want to market? And I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. And he said, invest. Don't look harvest now, invest. And I have used that, and by the way, it took a long time for it to catch up economically, but it did. It did catch up. And maybe more importantly than the economics behind it, I did what I liked. I thought that was, you know, I think that's an important thing. Now, this principle, by the way, is not only true in jobs. It's true with people. It's true with everything you'll do. But I, and there's, if you want to gauge how you can tell if you're looking to harvest or you're looking to invest, just roll that, that like 10 rule out in front of you. In 10 hours from now, how's this going to fill? In 10 weeks from now, how's this going to fill? In 10 months from now, how's this going to fill? And in 10 years from now, how's this going to fill? If you're doing anything in the 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 hours thing that's compromising 10 years, you're violating this, this idea. And, it will be, and I really believe it'll, it will be an issue for you. So think investment before you think of harvest, because the harvest will take care of itself. And I, and I get, it's hard. A lot of you are in positions right now, some of you are probably married. You're thinking, ah, I better start harvesting something here, or I'm going to be in big trouble. And there's some truth to that. You have to be practical about it. But I think as an idea, take away this idea, and you'll, you'll take away a winner this way. OK, I'm going to give you a couple things real quickly about things that if I were in your shoes, I would say, OK, if it were me, what would I be working on with me? OK? First one, this is an important one too. Um, there's a great book, by the way, if you ever want to read one. Um, it's a guy, youngest tenured professor ever at Wharton. Uh, he's there right now, a guy named Adam Grant. And he wrote a book, Give and Take. He studied every kind of profession he could find. Um, accountants, lawyers, salespeople, engineers. Uh, he he st took uh, industries. He also took functional roles. And he divided these people into three categories, people he thought were givers, meaning people who would, if somebody said, hey, can you help me with this? They went out of their way to help them. People who he identified as takers, which he generally put, said, were people who looked for people to help them, as opposed to offering the help. And people who he said were matchers, people who would help if they thought they would get the favor back, okay? Now, bottom 20% of every single industry he studied, you know who they were? No, that's what I would have thought too, givers. That's a different answer than you'd expect, huh? By the way, takers, you know, it sounds really terrible, but he said takers aren't people you necessarily hate. 
Sometimes they can be extremely charming and charismatic. About 85% of the CEOs he um, interviewed for this, he identified as takers, okay? Bottom 20% of every organization were givers, and the reason was is they had a tendency, like if you were a sales guy and they said, how can, how can I help you? Can you help me, Pat, because you're a really good salesperson? Pat would spend all of his time helping me, and he would stop selling, right? So that was a problem. Now, the interesting thing is the top 20% of every organization he studied was givers. And the difference between those two, the, the top and the bottom, is, is the premise of this book. Um, and kind of nutted down for you, the givers that were at the top, the, the primary difference, they gave even more. They gave even more. Um, you will know when you read this book, you'll say, oh, that person, that person is a giver. And what you'll find in almost every case is a warmness and an affinity for that person. Um, you know, look, I would advocate it because I think in, I, I've found that uh, we do what we call giver's breakfast at, at the company I'm with, where I'll take a lot of people, eight, eight to ten people, I'll take them to breakfast. The only requirement they have to have for me to buy them breakfast is they have to bring something that they need help with. It can be personal, can be professional, take your pick. And then I get the group together and I say, okay, this person is trying to find an apartment. This person is trying to figure out how they invest long term. This person is trying to figure out, you know, whatever. And we say, and, and everybody tells what they're looking for, and then you just say, how can we help? And it's been fascinating to watch what happens to people when they help, right? Problems get solved, but what's more interesting is what happens to the people who are solving them. This idea of giving more than you take and being valuable will make you professionally, it'll stretch you in ways you have no idea. Um, right now, I can tell you at our company, we beg people who are valuable to stay. Beg them. Just beg them. Okay? But again, going back to being intentional, you have to wake up every day saying, how do I add value to a company? I had to do that this morning and say, what am I doing today to make sure that I'm paying for myself at the Summit Group? All right? Pat, what time is it? I just want to make sure I'm 12.06. 20 minutes? Eight minutes. Okay. All right. So give more than you take. If I were in your shoes, that's one thing I would want to try to do to make myself a giver. Okay. Second thing, this is a, there's a, another really fun book out. You know, uh, Scott Adams, the guy that wrote, or that is the Dilbert guy, um, wrote a book, a business book. And you think, what, what is a Dilbert guy writing a business book? Well, this guy, he worked for a telecom company, which is what made him really interesting to me. And he was a financial analyst. I mean, this guy's got a, a Berkeley MBA. He's the guy that he's making fun of in the cartoons. He was that guy organizationally. So he writes this book that's, that's you know, I, mean, I think about two-thirds of it's really interesting and one-third of it is really kind of sort of just strange. But it's, it's kind of a good book to go through. And this, this thing hit me really hard. He said, you know, this idea of people looking for passion is just such a crappy business idea. He said, go ask anybody who loans money. If somebody walks through the door and said, I've, I want to do this and I want you to invest with me because it's my passion. He said, bankers run from that. Because like every bad thing that ever happened is because someone was passionate about creating a mobile dog wash, you know? It's like, okay, but is there a business there? You know? So this idea of passion, and I think somewhere, I think if I asked most of you, if, if passion, the most important thing you can do, come in, a lot of you would have said yes. Now, I'm not discounting liking what you do. Remember, I just told you the story of why I stayed into, with marketing versus why I, I didn't go a different route. But I think there's something that's more important for you to focus on. And you'll run across your passion if you, if you go into this thing. And it's your energy. And I don't mean this like in a kind of a new age kind of, ooh, energy. And that's not what I mean. I mean literally the ability. Think of it in like interval training. Anybody do interval training from a workout side? Okay, so what's that like? What's the concept of interval training? Tell me. Really quick, a segment of really quick, and then you go through kind of a rest period. Yep. Super intense, rest, super intense, rest, super intense, rest, right? The reason you rest behind that is because it increases your ability to go super intense for longer and even harder. That, my friends, is what life is. That's not just interval training. That's not just when you're running or lifting. That's what life is, and that's what business is. I have never met anyone, anyone, who wouldn't say they have stress in their job. Anyone, it doesn't matter what your position is. 
So what I tell people at the summit group is we'll provide the stress or the intensity. What we're going to help you do is find the rest behind it because that will make you stronger. So if I were in your shoes right now, I would make sure I was figuring out how to find rest behind my intervals. Okay? What does that mean? Well, at TSG, I believe in this so much because here's the other deal. In business, sometimes you don't get a pick when your interval is like on a treadmill. If I'm not feeling right and we've got a major client problem that day and I don't have anything to give, I get fired. I have to be able to deliver my best energy at whatever time is required, okay? So a couple things that I would really, and, and they, for some of you, this will be like secondhand, and for some of you, you'll be like, I'm you know, in my 20s, what do I need to worry about this for, okay? First off, ask yourself if you're getting enough sleep, okay? You're gonna be like, uh. Do you know in sleep studies that, that you know, literally missing two hours of sleep at night can have a similar effect as if you've been smoking marijuana. Probably with not near the fun that comes with that, I would suppose, right? Um, so sleep, it matters. There's a reason that all these health apps are tracking that, all right? Now, if you're, I guarantee there's somebody in this audience who's saying, ah, oh, geez, I only need two hours of sleep. Eh, that's not true. That is not true, okay? You might get it for a minute, you might get it for a couple of days, but go back to that 10-10 rule. You won't get it for 10 months, I promise you that. And you for sure won't get it for 10 years. Pay attention to how much you sleep. Second thing, pay attention to being physically active, okay? We offer a, we offer a personal trainer to every single person who works for us, available to them. And the reason we do that is not because we're trying to make some, you know, like, uh, not trying to win best place to work. What we're trying to do is make sure people have the energy to go when they need to go. Okay? And then the third thing is, and, and you'd say, boy, Todd, my life insurance company came back and said, my, my wife is like a ballerina who was a professional ballerina who if you saw her, is like, oh, that woman is in insane shape. You look at me and you say, as my life insurance said, your unique body style, right? <laughs> but... Two and a half years ago, I committed to working out four days a week every day for the rest of my life, and I haven't missed a week, okay? Big deal. Same thing goes for what you eat. What you put in matters too, and it matters for your energy. Forget all the health things and all that. All I'm interested in right now for you professionally is how, if you'll be able to go at full speed when the minute comes that you need it, okay? So, and then the fourth thing I'd say is, is that first idea, stay curious because that'll feed energy more than anything, as much as anything I've, I've found. So passion, you'll run across it. Business success, find your energy, okay? Those are the three ideas, or, the, the, or an idea there. So let's keep moving, so we're running out of time. Um, we had a, a woman, very sharp lady, who said to me uh, a couple of months ago, you know, this, this job's getting in the way of my life. <laughs> and I said, okay. Well, that sounds like a problem. What are, what are you going to do about that? She goes, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, it's not getting in the way of my life. What, what are you going to do about it? And she ended up deciding to move on. She ended up deciding that, um, that the job just got in the way of her life. So I've been thinking about that. And I'm not, even though I came from that time period of saying, hey, it's about charging forward, I've learned about experiences versus things. But I want to throw an idea out to you, because what I hear a lot is, I need to find work-life balance. Have any of you ever heard that? Have any of you ever felt that? Maybe? Um, well, I'm going to throw something out to you. And part of it's because I, I've never been very good at compartmentalizing anything. Everything kind of mixes into one thing for me. So I'm going to challenge you to never say, I need work-life balance again. What I would tell you is to say, I need life balance, OK? Because here's the deal. This thing of thinking that, um, that you're not going to have to work intensely hard to be successful is an absolute illusion. That is not real. Going back to that harvest thing, unless you can figure, if anybody here understands how to violate the law of the harvest, meaning you have to put a lot of hard work and sweat into that before you start to harvest, 
see me after because I'm interested in investing with you, right? If there is such a thing as that, it's probably located right next to that fountain of youth thing and, you know, the, the pot of gold under a rainbow and all that kind of stuff. The reality is you're going to have to work super hard. And when you hear people or you read blogs telling you that's not true, I would just tell you don't believe it because you're going to have to work really hard if you want to be good at anything, at anything. This idea, however, of saying instead of work-life balance, let me just have life balance because that can work out. Now, what does that mean? It means that you don't stop, you don't stop working the second you leave. I don't know of any real job that you get to do that anymore, frankly, because of those phones that we introduced. You just won't get that option. But what you can do is you can also not stop living when you go to work, right? You can mix those things. And if you give more than you take, it will work out. I promise you it will work out. And people will beg you to stay at jobs, not the other way around, all right? Okay, still rolling. This one. Have any of you guys ever seen this, heard about the, this two, these two kids that started this, this do hard things thing? They call it a revolution. These two kids from Oregon, when they were uh, 17, got frustrated with the idea of super low expectations on teenagers. And they said, this is lame. We can do so much more than what's being asked of us to do. Now, that's a really odd position for you know, having teenagers. That's kind of a different way of viewing it. So these guys started pushing other teenagers to do super hard things. Not little hard things, super hard things. Right? They built a website with it. They've had over 40 million hits on this site and scores of stories of what happened to teenagers when they decided to try something that was hard. Okay? Now, this is not, you know, to pick your pick, whatever your hard thing is. When you start those things, you're kind of like, ugh, ugh. When you get to the end of them, they're worthwhile. That's the investment and the harvest taking care of itself, right? You're going to run into a whole bunch of stuff when you're looking at this thing and you say, that seems awfully hard. That seems really hard. You know what I'd encourage you to do? Find a company that has a hard thing to do and dig in deep. That's where you become valuable. You know what we tell people when we pitch new business, and I can't win it off of just our, our credentials? I say, give me the worst project you have and see if you can get rid of me. Okay? Hard things should not be something, if I were sitting in your chair, that I would be going like this at, I'd be saying, find me some. Find me some. That's the interval that you want to push behind it. And again, the reason I started with the energy thing is because you're going to need to rest behind hard things because they're hard, right? But if you want to succeed, that's where I'd start looking. OK. Um, and then this is the last one. And I, I used to hate this thing because I was, I got a, uh, early in my career, I had some really crazy things happen that were way more luck than they were earned. And I found myself sitting in rooms that I should not have been in from an experience side. AT&T bought the company that I worked for, Macaw Cellular, and it became AT&T Wireless. And they had just bought a company uh, about three years before, a tech company that they had completely smothered. And so the Wall Street Journal, the morning they bought us, said AT&T about to stifle another entrepreneurial story. So for three years, they kind of went like this, mostly because their investors put so much pressure on them. So in that period of time, my boss left, and they said, and he said, I think he should do the job. Well, the people I was working with said, I think he should, he should too. But the people in New York said, you know, if it's all the same to you, the fastest part growing part of our company, we really don't want to entrust the brand marketing to a 28-year-old kid from Seattle. And, you know, to be honest with you, I kind of walked behind the door and said, man, I don't think they should either. Are you crazy? You know? But then I had a boss who said, look, Hard stuff is where the magic is. You can do this. So I walked back from behind the door and said, what are you, crazy? Nobody will, believe, no, nobody will be as enthusiastic about wireless as me. Why, why? You guys are nuts. So they ended up giving me the job because they had to. And the first meeting I went back to in New York with my new team, my boss had a group of 11 people. And at AT&T at the time, the thing you did when you started a meeting was, You'd say, uh, I'm Todd Wolfenbarger, um, I'm the VP of whatever, I've been with AT&T for X amount of years. Which was so strange for somebody who came from a tech company, because we're like, what are you, I don't know, I've been here for 15 minutes, but I was smart enough to think of that, you know? 
And I was not used to doing this. And so I was just kind of watching these people. And as it got to me, because I sometimes think or speak before I think, or I process stuff out loud is a not kind way of saying that, I'm like, man, this is bizarre. Four of you have worked for AT&T longer than I've been alive. <laughs> Which my boss thought was incredibly funny. None of my newfound peers thought that was that funny at all. <laughs> you know. And uh, I just kept thinking, oh, no, how am I going to get the experience that these people have? How can I push forward faster? How could I? I even thought, you know, I have a, Pat and I were talking about, my, my maternal grandfather is Italian, and he had jet black hair until he was in his mid-50s, and then it went the coolest shade of silver. And so I've always wanted gray hair, always. And it just, like, it's not really happened for me yet. Kind of in my beard some, but not in my head. And so I thought, man, maybe if I dyed my hair gray on the sides and stuff, then they'd think I was more experienced. And what I learned is I couldn't fake through that. I just couldn't. I had to go with what I had, and then I had to let time forge me. Now, you can do some things that help you along the way. That one-stepper idea is a super good one, OK? Get with people who are a little bit older. So I, all these people that I offended, over the course of the next three years, I bought every one of them dinner and said, tell me what you know. Tell me what you know. What would you do if you were in my shoes? And I have a book that I kept. Every time I'd go back to New York, I'd ask them this. And I've, I look at that, I've looked at that book probably once every two months in the, in the 15 years I've, since I've been at AT&T, because there were so many cool things that I learned in that process. But some of it is time just has to happen for you. And that's going to be challenging for you, because right now, um, you know, I, I, I read a thing that uh, I, I can't even believe this is true. I've tr been trying to, or I heard it on the radio. I didn't read it. But I've been trying to find the source for it. But over a 30-year professional career for somebody who's graduating right now, do you know how many positions? So it wouldn't be companies, but positions you'll be expected to have in those 30 years? 29. I'm like, what? How's that possible? But yeah, that's what it is. So this thing of letting time take care of itself, it matters. OK. I'm really close to the end, so I'm going to give you a couple of tools fast as we go through this thing. And I'm just going to hit them really quickly, a few of them. First off, this is a big one for me. <laughs> this idea, you want to read a good book, read a book called The Shallows. It's about what happens when people read short form copy only. The net out of it is, is you lose your ability for critical thinking. That's a big problem in business, OK? You have to read. You have to read, OK? It'll also teach you to write better which will be an incredibly valuable tool for you. Second tool, pick up the phone. This is Craig McCaw. He's the guy who said, when my, I took my first daughter in 22 years ago to the office, and he, Craig didn't have any kids then. He was just like, Ooh, it was like, almost like he sprayed disinfectant on Taylor as I was walking her around. He's like, you know, um, that child will think it's odd that she was, someone ever called her at home when she wasn't there. And this guy said, you know, Craig, most people just say cute kid. And, the interesting thing is he was right, because nobody calls you at home if you're not there, because you don't even have a phone at home anymore. What he was wrong about, what he would have never believed, is that people would just stop picking up the phone, and they'll do this instead. I am telling you, you'll, get, you'll understand nuance. You'll understand the ability to, um, to get stuff done quickly this way, OK? Um, next tool, say thank you a lot. It'll matter for you. Um, one of the best years of my life is when somebody challenged me to, to either write an email, leave a voicemail, have a conversation, or send a text saying thank you every single day. Now, I didn't hit 365 days, but I probably hit 350. And what happened to me was amazing. When you express gratitude for people that you work with or serve with, incredible things happen. You will be the one who benefits from the gift, okay? Last tool, and this is a big one for you. You know, if you have a smiling kitten, everyone thinks it's OK. This is an important one. When you are, you think about that 29 positions you'll have. When you're in a spot where you're looking to move on, I want you to think long and hard about that. None of you work for me, so this is not self-motivated right now, OK? Think hard about that. If you decide to leave, and there are lots of times when it makes sense to do that, think even harder about how you will leave. Because the world, turns out, is very small right now. And thinking, I just want to, you know, geez, it's better for me if I go right now and I leave the person behind. You know, I gave them my two-week notice. No, that is not good enough. What you need to do is leave that position and the teammates that you left behind in an ability to succeed. 
okay? So even if you have a smiling kitten, it won't make it happy if you don't do it right, okay? So those are the tools. I know we're right at time, so with that, you're in the best, most interesting time to ever launch into this. You're gonna kill it, you'll do well. Good luck.